morning Sunday school. And good morning to our Sunday school class, our Facebook listeners, and our YouTube listeners. We give glory to God on this Sunday morning. And before we start, we want to go into our devotion. And we're going to open up our devotion in song with Sister Barbara singing. God a hand clap of praise. We now have our devotional reading from Sister Kim. Good morning. Your reading, reading will come from Romans 9, the 11th verse to the 22nd verse. And it reads as follows. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It is said unto her that the elders shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then as their unrighteous with God? God forbid. For he said unto Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Mm -hmm. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God who shown mercy. For the scripture said unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, mm -hmm. and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore he hath mercy on whom he hath mercy, and whom he will be hardened. Thou wilt say, then unto me, why do he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but O man, who art thou that replies against God? Mm -hmm. Shall the things form say unto him that it is formed? Why hast thou made me thus? Have not the part of power over the clay? of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another one unto dishonor. What is it? God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known endureth with much long suffering of vessels of wrath fitted unto destruction. Thank you. Amen. We now have our prayer, Sister Taylor. Good morning. Praise the Lord. Wake up, people, and praise the Lord. Amen. Yes, and hallelujah. His mercy endures forever. Yes, God. We just ought to always praise him for the goodness that he shows us. Yes. The words that he shows us. Our Father is a good Father. Yes. Our Father loves us unconditionally. No matter what we do, our Father is always right there with us. Father, teach me how to pray. Yes. Teach me, Lord, how to pray. Yes, God. So we can wake up our family. Yes. So we can bring in more family. 
in here. Father, we need you yes, each God. every minute, every second, every hour. Father, I stand here as your child wanting our family to be a large family. Oh, hallelujah. Father, we need you. Thank you, Lord. Father, bring them in. Have an overflow, Father. Father, we want that. We need that. The only way we're going to recover from weakness, from being mean and hateful to each other, is coming to your house and hear the word. Lord, we need the word. We need the word. And the only way we're going to get it is we get together and be on one accord. Father, I thank you. Thank you, Lord. everybody in prison is not is not guilty. Father, just walk with us, Lord. Just bring us the attention that you want us to have. As I say, we need you, Father. Bless our family. Yes. Bless our Zion, Lord. Oh, yes. Bring us to the closeness that you know that we can be. Yes, I God. know that we can be. That's why I say, Father, teach me the prayer to give to my family that I also love. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Praise God. Amen. 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 Wasn't that a powerful devotion? Yes. Yes. And we thank you, Sunday School. This is our first Sunday of February. And we have our very own Dr. Denise Jones, a profound teacher. And she's going to come before us this morning with our Sunday school lesson, Faith in the Power of God. Let's give her a hand as she comes, Dr. Jones. It's indeed, as I said, a privilege and a pleasure for me to be here and to have this opportunity to just do the work of God one more time. And um, I can say it's good to be here, to God be the glory for everything that he has done. As I peruse, and I want to thank you once again, uh, Reverend Donaldson, for uh, this opportunity. The overall lesson for today is faith that pleases God. We're going to look at faith that pleases God. And in Unit 3 this morning, it's the righteous live by faith. Our devotional reading comes from Romans, the fourth chapter, 9 through the 22nd verse. The background scripture comes from Isaiah, the 40th chapter, 12 through 31. When I perused this lesson and I think, and I thought about faith that pleases God, and I thought about how the righteous live by faith, I looked at the lesson, and today's lesson comes from the writings of the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. His text is the first in the group of five referred to as the major prophet. You know, we have major and minors, but this is, we're talking about the major prophets. Those five are known as Isaiah, Jeremiah. Lamentation, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Some may wonder what the Old Testament books of the prophets still have 
in the New Testament era. After all, the days of those prophets, when we think about it, they're long gone. And we're under the new covenant, not the old. That's in Colossians 2 and 14. The value of the prophets today is firmly established in how many times they are cited by Jesus and the authors of the New Testament. One clue today to be aware of is how often these books are quoted in the New Testament. In Isaiah, it's quoted 67 times. In Jeremiah, five times. In Lamentation, it's not mentioned, but in Ezekiel, two times. And in Daniel, five times. These figures reveal the continuing relevance of the book of Isaiah. It's been called the fifth book of the gospel of its numerous prophecies declared as fulfilled in the numerous prophecies declared as fulfilled in the Masonic era of the New Testament. Isaiah 53 7 and 8 in Acts 8, 32 through 33. The text under consideration in our lesson follows a prophecy that warns King Ezekiel of Judea regarding a time when Babylon would carry away Judea's wealth and the people to Babylon more than a hundred years would pass before that happened. But guess what? It did happen. This was the punishment from the Lord for the people's sin, followed by comfort in declaring the punishment would eventually end. The prediction here that immediately follows in Isaiah 43 and 5 shift forward more than five centuries for fulfillment quoted in Matthew 3 and 3 and Mark 1 and 3. When we look at a supreme ruler, we often hear supreme rulers, ruler of this, ruler of that, not just in our country but throughout the world. But when we look, take it and we're looking at Isaiah, in the 40th chapter, verses 12 through 13, we see a overseeing creation. Verse 12 says, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, or with the breath of his hand marked off the heaven? Today's text comes to us in the form of a Hebrew poetry. This style often involves balance lines known as parallel parallelism. This means expressing the same thoughts across different lines using different words. When we look at the words translated waters and heavens, they occur about three dozen times in the Old Testament most closely aligned with the usage here is Genesis 1 and 20 and Proverbs 30 and 4. Isaiah uses this imagery to call attention to the things that God can do that humans cannot do. The rhetorical questions being posed are similar to that of the Lord, and they confront it, and it's been confronted with Job, because Job was confronted with this. Of particular interest in light of the half verse under consideration, when we look at modern sciences, they allow us to make educated guesses regarding the volume of water in the oceans, and the vastness of the space in the light years. All we're doing 
is a guess because that's all we can do is guess. But wherever the measure, no human device can determine those things with exactness. As human, we can look, we can assume, we can elaborate, but we cannot measure it because we're not the master. Only the creator can do this. The human mind cannot fathom the amount of water in the ocean or the distance of one galaxy to another. However, the creator can measure the distance using just his hand. In this verse, Isaiah declares the greatness of God and lays down the basis of the criteria by which the Israelites may compare their God to gods of other nations. When we look, let's look at verse 12b. Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? Isaiah's question has an answer. So obvious that it should not have to be stated. The verb that's been translated, one of the verbs held in this passage, implies something like contained. And that's found in Jeremiah 2 and 13, concerning a broken tank that cannot hold water. When we look at processing knowledge in verse 13, who can fathom the spirit of the Lord or instruct the Lord as his counselor? The Hebrew word translated spirit has a range of meanings. It means wind in Isaiah 7 and 2, breath in Isaiah 11 and 4, or one might be called attitude among an altitude among other meanings. The content determines what the water means at any given point. The importance of this verse for the New Testament era is seen in the fact that the Apostle Paul quotes it twice in Romans 11 34 and 1 Corinthians 2 and 16. Paul uses mind rather than spirit because he is quoting from the Greek version. Even so, his understanding of what the passage says about God is entirely consistent with Isaiah's. God's has never had to earn anything from anyone. Think about it. We have to earn from God. He doesn't have to earn anything from any of us. God is all-knowing. Isaiah 40 and 14 through 24, which comes between the two segments of our lesson text. It continues the prophet's confrontational questions. These include declarations of the Lord's superiority to the nations. Isaiah 4, 43, verses 15 through 17, and its earthly rulers. Let's look at, let's take a look at sustaining ruler. That's found in Isaiah 40, 25 through 31. And it's regarding his identity. To whom will you compare me? Or who is equal to me, says the Holy One? Who is equal to me? The prophet raised the question earlier in Isaiah 40 and 18. It reminds us that we should be extremely 
cautious with statements that start with God is like because the next word would result in the creator being compared to something that he and only he could create. Even so, Isaiah's question, to whom will you compare me, does not forbid certain fragments, languages. Whom will you compare me to? These languages were being used as illustrations of God's various roles. And these roles include being a shepherd in Psalms 23 and 1. It referred to God being a rock in Samuel 22 and 32. A shield and sword in Deuteronomy 33 and 29. A fortress in Psalm 18 and 2. And even that of a winged and feather creature. Psalms 91 and 4. These are not saying God's existence is equal or similar to any of those. Rather, such text, this text, illustrates various functions that God exercises, and God has the ability to exercise in various functions. The, des the destination, when we say, think about the Holy One, this is used especially by the prophet Isaiah. This frequency may be linked to the impression that Isaiah all made up upon him. In that communicating ceremony, he saw when he was going through life communicating with the Lord, he saw the Lord high and exalted. And he heard the cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. Isaiah 6, 1 through 3. Let's take a look at regarding his abilities. It's also, when we look at verse 26a, lift up your eyes. And look to the heavens, who created all of these. He who brings out the starry host, one by one. Isaiah was a powerful major prophet. But I'm one of them. Isaiah calls attention to the heaven as he did previously in Isaiah 40 and 12. And we'll do it again in Isaiah 54 and 6. Worship of the starry host was explicitly forbidden. Deuteronomy 4 and 9. But guess what? It happened anyway. Kings 127 and 16. With promised punishment that followed Jeremiah 8 and 2. To worship created things rather than the creator is to invite the death penalty. That's found in Romans 1 and 18. Let's look at verse 26b. And calls forth each of them by name because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Elsewhere in the Bible records the name of some stars and their constellations. That's found in Job 9 and 9. Whether covered by clouds or not, they are in the night 
without fail. Modern astrology sometimes let us predict with general accuracy the very rarely seen explosion of this supernatural thing. By one count, there have been only seven such explosions visible to the naked eye throughout history. Only seven visible that were naked, that the naked eye could see throughout history. Let's go to verse 27. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. In Hebrew poetry, the verb complain, and when we sometimes say parallel, they, and parallel, they parallel one another, as do the proper names Jacob and Israel, found in Genesis 32 and 28. This continues with the phrase, my way is hidden. Mirroring my cause is disregarded. Then the phrase from the Lord echoes by my God. One overall thought in this particular verse that's expressed is not two. It's just one thing. One thing. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing is hidden from God. Jeremiah 16 and 17. Let's look at verse 28. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God. He's the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary and his understanding no one can fathom. In life we grow tired. In life we grow weary. In life sometimes we can't seem to make it. But our God never grows tired and weary. Do you not know or have you not heard some of our favorite expressions of the prophet Isaiah? In Isaiah 37 and 26, the implication is that nothing is ever concealed from God. When we look at life, we know we often hear old cliche, God knows every strand on our head. God knew our existence when we were in our mom's bellies. He knew everything before we were even birthed in this world. So God knows everything without we, that's a person, we can't hide. We can hide from one another, but we can't do that from God. Even without having the benefit of scripture, God's characteristics are discernible from nature itself. God should not have to remind the people, us, of truth with which they are already familiar. The writer often, the writer offers different collection in terms of using different Hebrew words. For example, different Hebrew words, God, Lord, and Creator. This collection is the only place in the Old Testament where these three words are seen together as nouns. It seems that the writer wants no mistake to be made regarding the identity of the subject. God is not susceptible to human limitations. He does not tire. He never becomes exhausted 
like I do sometimes. He never slumbers. He never sleeps. Psalms 121 and 4. When we look at the phrase that says that God rested on the seventh day following the sixth day of creation, this is found in Genesis 2, 2 through 3, it does not imply that he became weary. It just simply means that he ceased his creative activity on the seventh day. We should take note of how scripture uses the word weary in different contexts. In the context at hand, that word is used with reference to God running out of energy, which we all know this does not happen. In Isaiah 1 and 4, on the other hand, the prophet uses the word in the sense of God being fed up, which definitely sometimes happens. Sometimes God has to teach us some lessons on this life's journey. This is found in Isaiah 43 and 24. These truths are expressed in this passage throughout the scriptures. It's already expressed throughout the scriptures concerning the Lord and his uniqueness, which are, and this is why the prophets, such as Isaiah, speak so passionately against the sin of idolatry, idol, and idol worshipers. And they, guess what? They do not harm God whatsoever. And they don't, and, he, and Isaiah was very explicit in his writings about God because he didn't want God to be harmed or nothing. Even though we can't harm God, he did not even want the people to even think about phantom, phantoming, to even say things about that. So Isaiah described it very thorough in this passage and in his teachings. Let's look at regarding our needs. Take a moment. In verse 29 it says, he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. The promise of strength from the Lord, especially during times of human frailty and weakness, resonates throughout Isaiah, Isaiah 12 and 2. And, found, and this is found in numerous passages of Psalms 18 and 32. The issue of trust, since God has his own timetable for replacing our weakness with his strength. Have any of you ever been going about your day and you got kind of weak in some time? I have. You had to grab a seat and sit down. You had to say, let me get this seat because I ain't feeling so strong right now. Let me grab it. But we know that if when we grab that seat and we trust God, he can do what? Regenerate and give us the strength to go on. When we trust in God, this requires waiting. And that's found in Isaiah 8 and 17. We have to trust. Few have expressed more accurately the need for and receiving strength of God, such as Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 11. His declaration, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. In Philippians 4 and 13, we have a song that goes, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I can't do it on my own, but God can give me the strength to do it. So that 
These are things we have to think about. It's God that give us the strength. Let's look at verse 30. Even youth grow tired and weary. Not just seasoned folks, not just middle-aged folks, even the youth. And young men, they stumble and they fall. Youth is often associated with vigor and endurance, something that diminishes with age. Because you know, you, in, when you, in your youthful years, you know, even with a baby, when a baby is born, just to use another analogy, they crawl first. Then they get up and they stumble and trying to walk. Then they walk. Then they can run. But as we go up in age, your, your steps begin to get a little bit shorter. We have to be a little more subtle because we don't have that spunk that we had at one time. So even in life, everything is a process. Let's look at verse 31. It says, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. To hope in the Lord is found in many places throughout the Bible. Oh, because that's all we got is our hope in God. To hope implies to trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. When we wait, we keep faith that God will work his purpose in our circumstances, even when the way forward is not obvious to us. But waiting does not come easy in a fast-paced world. And I say that because many times we pray to God, we want instant gratification. We want God, God, you got to come instantly. But he said, I may not come when you want him, but I'm going to come right on time. So God's timing is not our timing in our fast-paced world. And that often demand, because what do we do? We often want instant results. Our tendencies are too frequently is to act on our own timing and by our own judgment. We want to keep things moving, but sometimes God has to halt us. Have you ever been halted in your life? I have. I was running and running and running and running and running. And I and one I was running one point in my life, I broke and we're gonna continue. Broke my ankle. I thought I was doing everything. Broken in three places. And those at Mount Zion know I if that grew up here around me, 27 years old, on crutches, couldn't even put my foot down because I had broke, but I was running and running. Thought I was running and running. But sometimes, and I use that analogy to say. Sometimes God have to halt us and get our attention because it was an attention-getting moment for me. You may have to halt us because of the fast pace that we live in this life, and men, and sometimes we want instant gratification. When we look at mounting up on wings like eagles, this pictures an ability to soar into the sky. Obviously, to any potential distraction below. We want to fly high above the cloud like an eagle. But the Lord used this imagery when he established his covenant with the nation of Israel. He contrasted what he did to the Egyptians with how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself, found in Exodus 19 and 4. The concluding, they will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. 
offers yet more instances of this parallel expression. When we trust God, we can walk and not be weary. We can soar like eagles above the clouds because in this life you have tornadoes, you have storms, you have thunderstorms, earthquakes. But when we trust in God, we can fly above all of that like an eagle. And as we come to the close of this lesson, we think about no shortage here. When the impact, and many of you remember that, the impact of the coronavirus pandemic began and we felt it during the spring of 2020. You remember everything was shut down. We were all in our houses. We wouldn't come out without our mask and our shields on. We didn't want to, if I went to the store personally, I went at six o'clock in the morning trying to beat the crowd and with my mask and shield on. We were having church on Zoom. Zoom and YouTube was so popular, but God came in and the whole world, not just United States, the world was paused with that coronavirus that attacked the entire nation. But as we went through that, one result was shortages in many commodities. There were issues with businesses closing, restaurants, everything was closing, and logistically, limitation means that goods were not readily available as before. We can, it's, it have restored now, but during the coronavirus, you go to get tissue, you go to get Kleenex, you go to get paper towel, you go to get Lysol, you go to get these, uh, after we go get these wipes, if you had the Clorox wipes, you couldn't hardly find it during the virus. You could not find it during the virus. And I'm saying I never thought I would be in a world where I couldn't just go to the store and get me some Kleenex, get me some tissue. It was a scary situation. During this time, I took the time and I picked up my Bible and read it cover to cover. So that was something I did. I read it before, but I let it minister to me. I didn't just read it. I had so much time, I let it minister to me because everything was shut down. Stores simply ran out of certain items that we just couldn't get. And even after limiting our purchases, any of you remember going to the store that said you can only get one Clorox wipe, one package of tissue? That was a scary situation. And, I, and, I'm not, and many customers found themselves frustrated at being unable to purchase the things which came so easily before the pandemic. And, and many of us, like me, when I could get it, I ran out every day I could to stock up because it was a scary situation. And we know we had money, but we could not purchase these things the way that we were accustomed to all over the world. And in our passage today, it reminds us that as Christians, that the God we worship and serve has never been subject to any weakness, has never had any scarceness pouring out his blessings upon us, his resources are not limited. God's resources are plentiful because God has plenty for all of us because God is our all in all. The prophet's affirmations of God's incomparable sustaining power and his promise to provide strength to those who grow tired or weary have no expiration date. God's blessings for us, there is no expiration date. God's goodness and mercy for us 
has no expiration date. God's power and strength are available to all of us today. The Lord is with us when we are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Second Chronicles 15 and 2. The only restriction regarding our access to God's resources is our own sin and unwillingness to trust him for everything. And there's a thought to remember. Before I get to that, you know that song, I will trust in the Lord till I die. I'm going to stay on the battlefield till I die because all we have is our trust in God. Man may let you down, but God is all powerful. God is always there. God is our all in all. I love the Lord. He heard my cry. I love God because he first loved me. In Sunday school, I want you to remember this thought for today. There is no power shortage. There is never, ever a power shortage with God. And when we look around this world, remember that there's no power, nothing in this world that's equal to the power of God. So I say to you today, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not to your understanding. Acknowledge thy ways in everything, and God will see you through. Thank you, Sunday School, and thank you, Deacon Murphy. Amen. Amen. Sister Geraldine. Oh, we gonna do that. Yeah. Let's get Dr. Jones a hand again. And wasn't that a message of hope? Wasn't that a message of God is our creator, the beginning and the end? And as I read this lesson from the prophet Isaiah, and he had prophet, you, if you heard Dr. Jones when she first opened up, she talked about uh, the prophecy coming a hundred years before they, the Babylonians came and they went into captivity. Amen. They were being punished for their sins. And a lot of times our mothers and fathers punish us when we have to go to our room. Amen. Yes. But the prophet Isaiah did promise them in spite of them being gone into captivity, God will bring them out. He was talking about that faith and that hope. And that's what we hold on to today. We got to know that our creator is. Amen. We got to know that he'll give us strength in the time of our weakness. Amen. We got to know that even though we trust him, we get weak at times. Amen. I mean, all this Dr. Jones spoke about in this lesson. And we just hold on to those things, amen? And he will give you strength if you trust him, though. It's about faith and it's about trust. Is there any questions for Dr. Jones? Did anyone wanted to point out in this lesson that they heard, that she spoke on? Because he did say, that God is our all in all. Everything about God, we got to see within the earth. Amen. The 21st number of Psalms says, the earth is the Lord, the fullness thereof, and they that dwell within. Amen. Everything we have belongs to God. Powerful message. So with that, because it is our first Sunday, and I ask that as you go through this day, one of our most faithful Sunday school students have went on with the Lord. Amen, Mother Spearman. 
So let's keep our hearts lifted up towards the family. Let's keep the family in prayer. Amen. She was faithful to the Sunday school. In the last few years, I was she uh, sat in my class, always encouraging me. Amen. But she supported the Sunday school. She supported anything about Mount Zion. So again, we just ask that you continue to pray for the family. With that, Dr. Jones, you want to come back up and give the prayer and closing remarks? And let's give her a hand again as she comes. the book of not I'm going to turn to our closing prayer if you can just stand for this prayer Father we thank, thank you. you am I in the right one yep Father we thank you for the record left to us by the prophet Isaiah amen may we realize fully Mm -hmm. That with the New Testament, we now have immeasurably more insight into your nature than Isaiah did. Yes. Help us to take neither you, not your word, mm -hmm. for granted. Renew our strength as only you are able to do. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Our superintendent is here, Minister Donaldson. Before we close, Minister Donaldson, you have anything you would like to speak on? Amen. Amen. God is our creator. With that, may we all stand and be dismissed. Again, this is our first Sunday. We're asking that all the uh, planning committee for our pastoral search work their way to the front because we're going to immediately, uh, no, right at 10 o'clock, we'll go into our prayer. Amen. May the Lord watch between me and thee as we're absent, one from the other. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take about a five minutes. So we can